The Monashies has an abundance of fresh, pristine waters, fed by glaciers and clear mountain streams. These waters are the main source for the Shuswap River, which is one of the great river systems in British Columbia. The Wilsey Dam, located in the middle Shuswap River, has been part of the landscape since 1929. Constructed by the West Canadian Hydroelectric, now owned by BC Hydro, the dam powers two turbines, producing six megawatts of power. The idea of having power here coming from this facility, I think, is, is incredible. Uh, you know, we have a community that has its own you know, hydroelectric power station in it, and I think it, that the community should look at ways of, of developing this power station in a way where it can actually work with the environment. Sediment transport is a critical component of river ecology. Transported sediment forms complex substrate arrangements that define the ecological niches used by a river's unique aquatic and terrestrial communities in a continually changing process known as the shifting habitat mosaic. Two sleuth gates were put at the bottom of the dam during construction to help maintain the river's natural processes of transporting sediment downstream. The gates were opened every five years to allow the sediment to pass through the dam. In the 1970s, the gates were no longer used because of fishery department's concerns. Instead, a dredging program was put in place. Giles Shearing, a graduating master's student at UBC's Okanagan campus, was an employee with BC Hydro as a team member in the dredging program back in 2009. It was that experience and his interest in the salmon population and spawning habitat below the dam that lured Giles back to school and motivated his research. Gravel size is important to spawning salmon. Different salmon are, are different sized. Uh, Chinook, for instance, is a very large fish and the females are very powerful. When they come up to excavate their nests, they flip on their side and they use their tails as a tool for excavation. The rock size that they're able to move is quite large. Coho or, or sockeye, um, on the other hand, are, are not able to move as large a, um, a rock. And so we're interested in ensuring that, you know, all the different species of salmon that come up and utilize this habitat have the best conditions possible for spawning success. Anything that is, is like a dam, which has uh, some impacts on, on stream flows, will affect um, salmon that are, are rearing in particular systems, as well as that it, uh, it could have some impact on the spawning habitat, the, the gravels that are associated with, with uh, you know, spawning in, in various systems. Salmon swim from the ocean up the Fraser River and up the Thompson River and up the Shuswap River to spawn below this dam. They travel about 600 kilometers, uh, sockeye, coho, chinook, uh, pinks, and they, they spawn below the dam. And without this natural recruitment of material going below Wheelsey Dam, there's concerns that over time the gravel will coarsen and become too large for salmon to excavate their reds. Salmon are the only animals in the middle Shuswap River that bring nutrients from the ocean called marine-derived nutrients. They contribute to the ecosystem and provide nutrients for plant growth, invertebrate growth for bugs that are eaten by other fish species and small juvenile salmon. In recent years, spawning salmon, especially wild Chinook, have been declining in numbers. The exact reason for this is unknown. If we have a, a healthy ecosystem, uh, the salmon are there and part of that system. And when we start losing them, it's starting to tell us that maybe we're doing things a little bit wrong and uh, maybe we have to change things and, and make things a little bit better. I think anything that can be done to improve the salmon habitat in the middle Shuswap River uh, you know, has to be looked into. And uh, anybody who's got any, any ideas as to how this dam especially has impacted uh, the wild salmon, I think that any kind of that research is, is very important. There needs to be more knowledge, you know, on those systems, you know, especially where we can actually increase production. I think that's going to be very important. Making sure those ones that do come back have something to come back to. Try to increase a percentage that actually survive. It, it is a challenge at times to keep in line with what the community wants, what VC Hydro wants, what DFO wants. But we've worked together cooperatively for about the past year to try to make it work. We see it as the future for our area, for the community and for the fish. We do put a lot of value on the environment around our facilities. We invest back into the, the river systems that we have impacted. It's a triple bottom line approach where we're not only trying to uh, protect the ratepayer on how much our utilities cost by adding energy into the system, but we are balancing off with the social and the environmental values in the systems.
Giles believes there must be a way to reintroduce the sediment to the spawning grounds below the dam in an environmentally responsible way. So the question is, this material that's accumulating behind the dam, can it be moved past the dam uh, in such a way as to not have an adverse effect on the spawning gravel size of the salmon for the salmon that are utilizing this habitat below the dam? For the past two years, Giles has collected measurements of the river and studied how the river's natural sediment transport processes have changed and how they might be able to be restored for the betterment of the spawning salmon. Giles' research has four objectives. The first, to determine a way to measure sediment using an underwater camera. The second is to determine how the sizes of sediment throughout the river changed in relation to river features like dams and tributaries. The third, to determine how much available salmon spawning habitat exists in the river based on sediment size. The final is to use a computer model to test how sediment reintroduced below Wilsey Dam impacts gravel that salmon use for spawning. So again, the idea, Giles, you're going to be on a slope, and that's okay. So if, you're, if you were on this slope here, right, yeah. you're going to want to stand like this and have this upstream so that you are not um, influencing the flow with your feet. Right. Okay, and then you're going to want to sort of get... My role as a supervising faculty member is to ensure that all our graduate students receive excellent training, that they understand the theoretical basis upon which they are, are founding their research, and that they develop a set of tools and techniques that they can then parlay into their life after the degree. And so whether they wish to go into consulting or go on to other academic environments or work for the government, um, they need a whole set of methods and tools and theories that uh, underpin those things, and that's what my responsibility is. Dams have multi-uses that are a benefit to society. What we've come to understand is that they have some environmental consequences that go beyond just displacement of, of habitat upstream where the reservoir is. This has sort of evolved as we've begun to understand more about the systems that we're trying to intervene in. A lot of this is driven by fisheries concerns, uh, certainly in the Pacific Northwest, you know, and repatriation of the salmon. Um, but the smaller dams also have impacts, um, and they're more localized. And so the real question is not how to manage the water so much, but how to manage the water in the context of the environment that it's, it's flowing through. And in particular, in my case, how we also manage the sediment, because the sediment flows with the water. And so we've not really thought about that very much, but that obviously has some important consequences. Okay, no, wait, let me know when you're down. So, uh, are you down? The results that we get from this study will be one among many that others are doing in different locations and hopefully we'll be able to better understand what the impacts of dams are so that we can make better decisions about whether to decommission dams um, and how to construct them in the future in a more environmentally sensitive manner. I think it's time that we took a look at this and to see if there are impacts or negative impacts to the fisheries from removing this load. To me, it, it doesn't seem right that we pull that much material out of the river to pile it on the edge when, when nature was trying to have it passed down through the facility. Having university and academia doing work around salmon related issues is a piece of information that the department could use in, in moving forward with management decisions uh, in relation to salmon. If we have the right information, then we can make the right decisions, evaluate things properly, and, and move ahead with things. We're very pleased that he's in the community, and it's a good partnership for us. And um, having someone new to look at things from a different angle, his scientific approach has been an asset. We're very much looking at it from the community benefits and the community risks and the risks to our environment. But he's brought a whole new sort of perspective to the project. With over 800,000 small dams worldwide, Giles' ongoing research will be significant to other dam operators who are looking to balance power production with ecological values. No better place than the river. <laughs>